this is going to be really different. So um, you have been listening to lectures about very specific topics in diabetes for the last several weeks. And so I'm sure they have given you a lot of information about diabetes, type 1, type 2, all the other stuff. Diet, exercise, medications, all of it. Um, this is going to be a little different. So um, what I thought I would do is rather than giving me, uh, giving me, giving you a lecture, um, which is always nice, but after a while, you know, lectures and lectures, I thought it would be a much better learning experience if we could interact together using your personal experience to explore the emotional side of diabetes. Um, because that's, an, um, that's a kind of personal side. And it's not fact-based, it's experience-based. So if we can focus on the experience, we can use that as kind of meat to drive the information that we want to communicate. Okay, so you know a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a psychologist, um, and I've been working in diabetes for about 30 years. I have a clinical practice, but I only see individuals, adults with diabetes. That's my whole practice. And, um, um, and we do a great deal of research over the years in the kind of stuff that I do clinically, because you can't do one kind of without the other. So it works well. So you know a little bit about me. And by the way, uh, all the, most of the folks that presented earlier are at the Diabetes Center across the street. I think they may have mentioned that, and that's where I am as well. So, so let's find out a little bit about you so I know who I'm talking to. How many of you have diabetes? How many of you have type 1 diabetes? Ah, OK. How, obviously, how many of you have type 2 diabetes? Your blood testing, so you have type 2 and you may have type 1? No, um, just beginning to have symptoms of type 2. Gotcha, okay. So you're kind of pre, just begin, pre diabetes. Okay, how many of you um, may have had, um, uh, let's see, there's no kids here. How many of you are the partners of people with diabetes? Ah, well, congratulations for being here. I don't think people recognize how important your role is. So thank you. We've done a lot of work with partner, and I'll share some of the stuff because it's kind of neat. Um, OK, there, uh, my pre-diabetes we mentioned. Pre-diabetes. Anybody else with pre? OK, OK. So there is a subset of us with, um, with diabetes, but another subset without. Of the subset without diabetes, how many of you have other chronic diseases, other than age, which is a, another kind of chronic <laughs> disease? How many of you have other chronic diseases? You do. OK, cardiovascular disease. Yes? OK. You do as well. Cardiovascular, um, some kind of long-term cancer, something. OK. OK. All right, so if you put all that together, everybody's got kind of something. <laughs> or if you don't, you either live with or know somebody or are close to someone who has a chronic disease. Yes? Well, that's because 80%, 80 cents of every health care dollar spent in the United States is in support of what? People with chronic disease. 80 cents of every health care dollar. It's a huge amount. So the health care system is geared to acute care. You know, you go in, you got a problem, you don't feel well, they treat the problem, and you go home. Problem's done. That's the acute care model. But in chronic disease, by definition, it's a whole different model because the diabetes doesn't go away. The cardiovascular disease doesn't go away. It continues. And there's a kind of disjunction between how the medical system in general treats chronic disease because it's so acute care focused. OK? And that's where people with chronic disease often get caught in the middle, whether it's because of the insurance companies or the health care systems. People fall through the cracks because these are ongoing problems, not something where you go in and get quotes fixed and then, and then you leave. OK? So why do you, other than the fact that they wanted to save best for last, why do you think 
they put something like the emotional side of diabetes into this program. Why do you think they did that? After all, how many sessions were there? Six. Six. So six. one out of six. Notice it's just me today, not, not two people, just me. So why did they do that? So that maybe you could cope better with it if you realized what your emotional response was? So you could co cope better. So somehow coping with chronic disease is a really important issue. Why do you think that's important? Excuse me, I'm sorry. We, we all have emotions. We all have emotions, but how, why would that play out in chronic disease management? After all, if you're talking about diseases like, um, like diabetes, we're talking about blood glucose levels, we're talking about medication management, right, we're talking about all that stuff. What does emotions have to do with all that? It impacts the development of the disease or the progress of the disease. Okay, that's, that's a whole other, okay. It impacts the development or pr progression of the, of the disease. So there's two things that were just mentioned. You mentioned that it has to do with how well we as individuals cope with a chronic disease, right? You said that it affects the actual development and progression of, so do you think emotions are related to, the, to causing diabetes? Could be. Could be, what do you rest of you think? How so? How would that work? How might guess? It affects behaviors, the behaviors that lead to uh, uh, the, the diet and, and exercise and so forth that can uh, lead to diabetes. Okay, so what you guys are saying, and correct me if, if I don't have this right, but I think what you're saying is how you feel affects what you do, what you do affects whether or not you end up with a diagnosis. Yeah, I'm, I'm stretching it, but I think that, that's the logic of the sequence. Do, would people agree or disagree with that? No. Every, no. No, because I think what happens is your emotions impact your chemistry, and the chemistry then impacts. Yeah, your, your chemistry uh, impacts the health of your organs. How would emotions do that? because emotions can impact um, the, the various, uh, enzyme is not the right word, that's but a digestive certain word. certain physiologic but, mechanisms? Yeah, physiological mechanisms that the brain controls. Does that make sense to folks? Yes. Okay, so it's very interesting what you're saying because there's a good deal of research on this. What the research tends to show is, let's take diabetes, because that, frankly that's the one I know most about, and I don't want to talk about other chronic diseases, although I got a hunch it plays out the same way, because a lot of these are lifestyle kinds of things. So for example, um, one of the things they found out was, and, and there's several studies on this, and I, I have some questions about them. They said that depression, high levels of depression leads to diagnoses of diabetes. Have you heard any of that stuff? Some of your, okay, so there's several large-scale studies out there where they have in, in some of the Scandinavian countries where they have registries, you know, of people of almost the entire country. And they can clock onset of X and see what happens 20 years later in terms of onset of Y. Make sense? And what they tended to show was that people diagnosed with depression have a higher probability of being diagnosed with diabetes sometime later in their life. And that fits in with what you were talking about, with emotions, right? Make sense? Well, maybe not. Is it the depression that's causing that? Or could it be the fact that people who are depressed tend to be less active, they tend to eat more, they tend to get heavier, right? So is it depression or lifestyle, or the result of depression in terms of its impact on lifestyle. So you shouldn't be saying, so to speak, and I'm, I'm posing this as a hypothetical, that depression causes diabetes. That might not be right. It may be another third factor that plays out among the depression and diabetes. Lifestyle. So for example, among those with schizophrenia, which is a totally different group than what we're talking about, they're talking about high rates of diabetes. Now one thought is that the medications that, that folks with schizophrenia take 
may do something physiologic and cause it to happen. But it also could be fa the fact that many people, these are VA studies, by the way, and one of the things that was interesting is that if you've ever been in the VA over the years, it's different now, but over the years, lots of these, el these folks, mainly men, were spent a lot of time at the VA sitting and smoking, drinking coffee, and being totally inactive. Right? I mean, you can just picture how that plays out. So again, my argument is you've got to be careful about saying what leads to what. Because often, it's just correlational. And it doesn't imply causation. Because we throw out causation, even though it's correlational. So I wanted to make that distinction. But I, th we'll get back to your point about there's a reverse thing. You also could say, for example, does diabetes cause depression? We'll talk about that in a minute. You were going to say something. No, I was wondering about stress. What about stress? Good point. What do you think? <laughs> Well, well I, we hear constantly that stress reduction is one of the keys to combating diabetes, too. OK. Um, what she said was, what about stress? Because it seems from what she knows and has read that um, high levels of distress are associated with onset of diabetes. Do I have that right? OK. What do you think about that? Science is all about splitting hairs, and I, I think that's what we're doing here. I mean, we're all, each one of us contained within the perimeters of our skin, and we're biological, physiological, biochemical organisms, so everything is connected to everything else. Sure. So uh, it seems to me that depression, str stress, um, all of these, it can lead to lifestyle factors. All of these things can lead to diabetes. Diabetes is this sort of generalized, strikes me, it's this generalized disease that has similar manifestations that can be caused by many, many things. I don't want to overwork the point, but uh, yeah, it's all I, connected. It, it, you're absolutely right. Th when you try to partition things out, you can split hairs. Where it's important to split hairs and it's not necessarily in every case. But where it's important is to understand the mechanism through which this works. Because if you can understand the mechanism, you can come up with treatments. And that, because if you stay at this grand level of everything being related to everything else, well, what do you do about handling specific problems? You don't know where to kind of jump in. So I think it's a two-tiered system. At one point, you have to recognize the context of everything social environment. Um, for example, one of the things they noticed about, um, about certain ethnic groups who tend to be in poverty, high poverty areas is that they're food deserts. Food deserts. You can't, a food desert. Anybody hear that phrase? Yeah, OK. You can't, if you live in certain parts of San Francisco 10 years ago, you could not buy fresh vegetables unless you got on Muni mm -hmm. to go across town. Even if you could afford them, it wasn't available. You go to your neighborhood bodega, and you know what you're going to get. You'll get, you know, you'll get um, potato chips and, and all kinds of other stuff, but you couldn't buy string beans. Fresh, good, tasty, for beans. You couldn't do that. So there's a social context contributing to perhaps the, the onset, because you're not having a good diet. And for people with diabetes who need to have that, they couldn't get access. So it got worse. So that's why, in part, in part, that's, some of the, that's one of the things that contributes to high rates of diabetes among certain <laughs> ethnic groups. The unavailability of health care, that's one. The fact that people are poor, that's probably two, because of access because of access not only to healthcare, but access to good food, safe parks, safe areas to exercise. I was at, um, I won't tell you which clinic, but we're doing a lot of work in community health centers throughout the whole Bay Area. I was at two community health centers, this, one in this morning, one this afternoon, we're doing a project there. And, although, and we're doing all kinds of interventions to help lots of these, but they're all folks with diabetes. I won't go into the details, but one of the things that the staff was having the most problem with 
was getting resources to help poor people manage their, their disease. Getting the right medication, getting safe places to exercise, walking. You can't go out in some places. You know, after work, you just, you don't want to do that, you know. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and also getting access to healthy food. You can't do that. And at price, like everybody's saying, you know, fish is great. Eat fish. Do you know how expensive fish is? You know, it's, it, it, well, look at the double message we're giving. So it's social context. That's one big aspect. And the other is emotional context. So let me ask you some questions about the emotional context. You just sat through five lectures, well, actually more than five lectures, a bunch of lectures in the P, right? Mm -hmm. Five weeks, but several lectures, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. What did, did you, what did you hear that surprised you about diabetes, that struck you about it? What did you hear, any of the folks who presented, what was striking about what they said that you thought about? Yes? That people feel like they can shame you if you're, or blame you for your disease because you're not doing it right or you're not, you're eating the wrong thing or people feel like it's okay to sort of publicly comment on folks with diabetes behavior. That surprised me. Everybody here? Why did that surprise you? It struck you, huh? They do it to you when you're pregnant. I don't know why they don't, wouldn't do it to you any other time, but it <laughs> So it, are they saying in some sense that you caused it yourself? Yes. Like it's your fault. It's why your are you fault. Eating that? Yeah. Why? Yeah. That's and, what I got from it. Anybody ever, anybody react to that? Those of you with diabetes, yes. I accept that what you said, but I also like to point out when we had the program where we saw the devices, the technological device available to all of us now, how easy it is for us to overcome things that the previous generation behind us could not even dream of. So we have the means and, me and methods to overcome this difficult disease if we just do the right thing and come to programs like this and listen to what we're told to do. You know what that is? I'm going to, I don't mean to be critical, but you know what that is? That's the wagging finger. If you'll only do the right thing, you'll get healthy. <laughs> and you didn't do the right thing, and that's why you've got this disease. <laughs> right? I don't think people without diabetes realize the shame and blame that people with diabetes experience. It's palpable. And when you sit down and talk to folks, we run groups of folks and try to get some of this out, it's demeaning. And it takes the air out of them because they're feeling like it's my own damn fault. I did it to myself. Do you know what that does to motivate people to take care of themselves? They're demoralized. It's a powerful underlying emotion. And that struck you, I take it. Yes? Yeah. It really, and it's, it really is an important issue. And it comes up constantly. Folks with type 1 very different than folks with type 2. They tend to be thinner. They're not as large. Um, their histories are different. Their genetics are different. It's very different things. Folks with type 1 are furious for, with, to, with folks with type 2. Why? Because the type 2 folks get, are the big guys who caused it themselves, and they didn't. They got it through another mechanism. It, it, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's all psychological. I mean, none of this is real. But there's a belief about it, and they experience this way, and it affects how they manage their disease. How about, what else struck you? Other than what, we'll get back to the shame and blame, because that's a good one. Yes, ma'am? It seems a very difficult disease to manage. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. Oh, excuse me. Um, it seems that it's difficult to manage. You have to test yourself. You have to take a basal dose as well as a bolus, bolus. dose. And if you've, you know, forgot to bring enough with you when you went on vacation, you've got a big problem. I mean, it just seems like a very difficult disease to manage. So a couple of years ago, I was running this group in San Diego with some friends of mine, with Bill. We're, we know this guy. And um, 
he and there are only three diabetes psychologists in, in, in California. I'm one, Bill's the second, and there's a woman in San Diego. Bill Plonsky's a friend and colleague. And so we were constantly talking on the phone. So we ran this group, and we asked them to do a favor for us. It was a two-day group. So the first day, we gave them the instructions, and the second day, they brought it back. And that was, we wanted to know how many times during the first day they made a decision about their disease management. Okay? Make sense? Do this, do that, don't do this, do that, right? Okay. After it hit 150, people gave up. One day. So when you bring up the burden of, oh, by the way, there's no vacation. You don't leave your diabetes at home, go to Hawaii for a week. Yeah, you're right. Right? So one of the things that emerges is a feeling of, I've had it. I can do this. I do it. I do it regularly. For many people, it's called burnout, a sense of, you know, how many times do I have to do X or Y? Calculate the, if you're type 1 or on basal bullets, you know, calculate my carbs, check my this, do my that, you know, all this stuff, figure out how much I've got, get the extra syringe just in case, line myself up, is the sensor okay if I'm on CGM? Is the pump thing, is the little tube clogged? Am I getting everything I need? It is an enormous burden that I don't think we as people without, or at least me, without diabetes realize it, realize. But when you sit down and you talk to people, that emotional burden really comes across. So blame and shame, burden, all, all emotions, right? What else that struck you? I'm a person who's pre-diabetic. You know, my A1C is climbing, and that's why I took this class. But um, he told me that um, type 2 is, um, is like one that really runs in families. And so I don't know if I understood him correctly, but that kind of came as a surprise to me because I thought, you know what I mean, that I could, you know what I mean, like just manage myself out of it. And um, so by managing myself, I just ate too few carbs and lost, lost weight, weight. Yeah. but my A1C still went up. Sure. And so I, got, I learned better that um, I actually do need to eat appropriately and just it will be what it will be, if I understood it correctly. It's a complicated issue, <laughs> to put it mild, like most things. It's, it's, it's complicated, the role of with, w the, the genetic imp impact, the environmental impact, the stylistic impact. These are all pretty complicated issues. Um, but one of the things I wanted to address that you raised that I think, is, I think you hinted at, running in families, what about those with diabetes wondering whether they're going to pass it on to their kids? My understanding is that if you were coming from the, the mother with uh, gestational diabetes, you are likely to be pa um, passing that. Um, There's a higher risk. Kids. Yes. And, and they, they're already, you know, from starting, right starting out there in disadvantageous, you know, physical right, uh, condition. So that is a very sad thing in life. Yes, especially for a mother to carry it around with her. What effect does that have on a mom knowing that, especially with this kind of diabetes, that there is a relative, relatively higher rate? I mean, it's not one to one. It, it's just a higher probability. And I frankly don't know what that statistic is. But suppose you, it, it wasn't around pregnancy. Let's say it was type, regular run of the mill, if there is such a thing as type 2, or regular autoimmune based type 1, OK? The first question that comes up when you're 22 years old and just got diagnosed is, what effect is this going to have on getting a relationship and having a family? And the, and the burden that places, the worry that places on people is enormous because it's so influential on how they see themselves, especially for women. The other side of that is, and I'll raise an, uh, uh, another issue related to this, about having a relationship. 
how in God's name am I going to have a relationship when I get intimate with someone and I got 47 things hooked up to my body? What effect is that going to have? So I'll give you an example of something that struck me with a, a, a woman that I worked with a couple of years ago who had a CGM and a pump. She was type 1 for many years, really experienced type 1 person. Um, and um, I'd been working with her. She was really down. She was just burned out. It was enough already. And, one, and she, she, when she came in, I noticed she was a very nice woman, nicely attractive, well-groomed, well-dressed, very tasteful woman in terms of her apparel. And after about three or four meetings, she finally, I, I couldn't figure out what was going on or why she wanted to come in. It became apparent she was 46-ish, 47. Things change in women's bodies at this age. Well, men's bodies too. But it changes for everybody. But she was very um, sensitive about the changes in her body and, and all the wires and whether she would be continuing to be attractive to her husband. And it was like, I hadn't thought of that at that age. I would think about it for a 20-year-old or 25-year-old, but they had been married for 30 years, 25 years, whatever it was, but that issue remained strong. Somebody's nodding. What do, you, do you mind if I ask you what you were nodding? Did I mean, right? No, no, this gentleman here. Was that, I didn't mean to embarrass you. But. <laughs> Maybe I did. OK, no, that's all right. We'll leave it go. <laughs> <laughs> couples after that. You're okay, okay, I'm sorry. Yes. A lot of couples after that many years of marriage go through a lot of transition. So you have that. The normal transition. Normally at, going on. The developmental change. Then you add diabetes on top of that. Uh, it, it compounds it. Yeah, especially, you're absolutely right, especially when there's so much fear of complications. Yeah. And after 15 or 20 years, people get increasingly worried. Okay, so what we're, we're identifying here in a lot of different ways is how the emotional side of diabetes plays out across the board. And I want to get back to what you said because I didn't mean to cut you off. What this gentleman had said was, look, we've got so many wonder, you have no idea in the last 10 years how diabetes treatment has changed. It's revolution revolutionized. There are multiple, multiple new medications for type 1 and type 2. There are CGMs. Libra, how many? You, you know what Libra is? Yes. You know, no, some are saying it. You know a glucose monitor, regular glucose monitor? You know, you have to stick and then you do you all this. Okay. Libra is like a CGM, but it's not nearly as expensive. It's not as sophisticated. It doesn't do as much. But it's sure better than sticking your finger 37 times a day, okay? So it's, and it's inexpensive, relatively speaking. So a lot of people are, especially in type 2, are moving to use it. Okay, so you have CGM, you have closed loop systems. Everybody know what the closed loop system is? No? Yes? You know, where, where, where it takes a reading off your CGM and then, and then the algorithms decide how much insulin you're going to get from your pump so you don't have to worry as much. Wonderful, right? If you take 100 people and you offer them a closed-loop system, how many will use it? Hmm? 99, she says. I'll give you another example. You have to take a shot every day of, in, of medication X. It's too much for you. I'm going to give you a new medication you can take once a week. Isn't that terrific? How many people will take it? We'll say, switch. 99. 99. Would I surprise you to say that the number of people who will agree to take a closed loop system is below 50%? And would it surprise you to, to learn that the number of people who will agree to the one shot per week rather than five or seven? Do you, it's, it's a little more than that, but it's around 50%. Why? They're great medications. It makes life easier. Why wouldn't they do it? Why? I mean, uh, could they be fearful of the technology? One. What if it fails? I'm not trusting. And <laughs> Two. Thing, the other thing is, would you find that younger people are more comfortable with technology? Three. <laughs> <laughs> so what you get a whole mess of things. Can I trust it? Do I tolerate technology? 
What was the third, the last one? I forgot. Younger people, Younger people are more comfortable to begin with. Right. Okay. So here's the, we did the study on the, on the, one, the shot, the one, the one shot a week. And we also did the study on the closed loops. And there's wonderful stories, because I interviewed these people, spent about an hour on the phone to find out what was it, you know. The problem with the one shot a week is they didn't trust it. It's not going to last. I don't care what, it's, what the, my doctor says. A week, it, the, 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 the level will go up, and then over the week, it's going to drop down. I don't care what they tell me. It's not going to last a week, and then I'm going to be stuck. I don't trust it. Well, wait a minute. Here are the data. Look at the curves. Yeah, I'll take my, then they were afraid they'd forget it. I remember if I take it once a day, but if I have to wait for the end of the, I don't, I'll forget it because I'm not doing it every day. Right? This is the psychological, emotional side of diabetes. So a little anecdote about the closed loop system. There's a group at Mass General who had two closed loops operating at the same time. The closed loop system we mostly use like Medtronic, which is the authorized one. It has an insulin well. And every time your CGM says you need more insulin because your blood glucose is going up, it gives you a little shot, it diffuses it in, and it gets it down to a point where you're okay. Right? That's what a closed loop is. Okay. This system was even fancier. Because all this, the original closed loop system would do is it would lower your blood glucose with insulin. Well, what happens if it gets, if you're doing some exercise and it's going down even lower, there's nothing in the system to get it back up, right? So the second pump that they wore was glyco, 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 glucagon, glucagon. You know what glucagon is? It's sugar, okay? So the sugar is in the second well. So if it goes up too high, the insulin comes out. If it goes down too low, the glucagon comes up. Clever, really clever, right? I mean, it, and it's just ingenious that they got this to work. Not only did they get this to work, they got the insulin and the glucagon not to spoil. That's one of the problems. They were able to keep it in the well so that it wouldn't spoil. Because, you know, after a while, you know, you can't keep stuff like this. And it worked. And they had an amazing algorithm built into the system that kind of kept everything the way it was. So we ran it on the first 20 patients, and the, <laughs> and the um, FDA, for us to get approval, required that a nurse follow, <laughs> follow them around because they were afraid that if the system didn't work, somebody would be in trouble and they wanted to have someone medically there. So in the beginning, we had to have a nurse follow everybody around for a little bit. After a while, it was fine, and the nurse didn't have to do that, but you can imagine what it's like walking around with a nurse following. So, but anyway, the thing I wanted to highlight was that at the end of the, of the two months that they wore it, I interviewed all 20 of them for an hour each. And it was a wonderful experience to learn what it was like because they had the most sophisticated, advanced technology you could imagine. A bunch of these folks said they were so depressed when, we had to get, when they had to give it in because it was like the first time in their lives they didn't have to do the 150 decisions a night, a day. And after a while, they started to trust it. One guy said something I'll never, it just, I would have never thought of that. And that was, he said for the first time in the last 20 years, when he went into a room, he didn't look for where the men's room was. Why? Because he might have to go and take a shot. He didn't have to do that. He said it was so freeing. I could begin to live without having those wheels, the diabetes wheels going. A whole bunch said they couldn't wait to get it off. Sure. And I asked them why. And there was the issue of trust. There was also the burden of carrying around all this junk. But a couple of them said something that was really striking. And that was that their partners wouldn't let them keep it. The partners didn't like it. They weren't sleeping. They didn't trust the damn thing, and they were up half the night waiting for something to go off. The partner influenced the person with diabetes reaction. So it's a social context. It's not just the individual with the disease. This is a social, in, in a family relationship, it's one partner, the second partner in diabetes. There's three entities in the system, three separate entities. 
Okay? So I, you can see how, when we're talking about the emotional side of diabetes, this gets really complicated really quickly. And it should because it's human. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like how we all react. So how many of you are partners of people with diabetes? Okay. Um, what's it like for you? Big open-ended question. What's it like for you being the partner of someone, you're living with someone with a chronic disease like diabetes? What's it like? Trying not to hover over the person. You mean you're not going to be the diabetes police? Trying not to be. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. <coughs> Can you repeat that? Uh, she said, no, trying not to hover. hover. Sorry. I, I, trying not to, tell me, use other words. Well, no, exactly what you're saying, the police. I mean, to be watching over the person, yeah. Why, why, what, why are you, what are you worried about? Well, we want him to take care of himself. But well, wait a minute, you know? if you want him to take care of yourself, of himself, why are you hovering? Don't you trust him? Uh, I'm putting you on the spot, I know. I, I don't mean to, but I'm, I want to push the point. married 50 years, don't worry. Good. <laughs> good, good to feel. But yes, you worry. What are you worried about? That's one. Because if it does, who's going to be around to take care of them? Right? You. What else are you worried about? I mean, I mean that's fine. It's OK. A lot of people are worried about whether somebody's going to have a hypo, especially if they're driving. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Right? Can I trust my partner, male or female, doesn't matter, the person I'm involved with, are they going to check their blood glucose before they get behind the wheel? Are they going to take care of themselves and not do something stupid and get a high, real high, like when you're out to dinner? Did I ever tell you about the, um, the glancing wars? Do you know about the glancing wars? Okay, I'll give you an example and I'll see if this fits for you. My wife, thank God not anymore, but when she was at a certain age, she started getting migraines which is evidently reasonably common among women going through menopause. So she would get uh, migraines. Do you know what the two triggers that really got to her migraine started a migraine? Any of you have migraines? Nobody? Oh, good, 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 good. Can you imagine what? Sulfites. Sulfites. Sulfites are found in? Uh, red wine. Red wine. One. <laughs> chocolate, two. You, you see? OK. <laughs> That's right. Red wine and chocolate are two things that are for many people, not for everybody. But she, my wife, and I enjoy a good bottle of wine once in a while. Uh, maybe more than once in a while. OK. So we had, I found myself into the diabetes police worrying business. But it was never verbalized. You know how we communicated? Glares. <laughs> yeah. So we would be, and here's the example, glares, she said. So we're out to dinner and some, but with some friends who are real whinies, and they order a really good bottle of red wine, and I'm, you know, and she's got a glass over here, and I have a glass over here, and I look at her. <laughs> and the message, is, what's the message? Don't drink that. Don't drink it. And she looks back, and what does she say? Don't tell me what to do. OK? You're nodding. OK. It's not, there's not a word spoken, OK? I look down like that because, because I can feel that, I can feel it. Oh, you know, it's starting to boil. She reaches out and looks me right in the face and takes a sip and puts it down. Not a word, you're, we're all smiling. But that kind of communication doesn't have to use words because you're communicate you know each other so well that even a look of the diabetes police to him is enough to boil so the question is who owns the disease in a relationship is it your disease or is it our disease well how do you how do you do that 
especially when she wants you to do, and I'm, I'm just making this up, so, especially if one partner wants to do the person with the disease, wants them to do something differently, or do more of, or less of. Who has the final say? How does that work? Is there a discussion about it? And that's why I end up seeing lots of couples with chronic disease. <laughs> because it can be emotionally taxing for both. Really emotionally taxing. An anecdote. About 20 years ago, we did a series of studies with couples in which one, person, one, of, the cup, one of the members of the couple had type 2 diabetes. Okay? We had about 500 couples participate over a period of three years. And they were, they were structured to be Hispanic couples, African American, Asian Americans of different groups, and, um, and Anglo Americans. So we, because how people interact in couples is partially culturally determined. Make sense? I mean, we were kind of logical that that would happen. Well, one of the, what we were interested in is the social context of disease management. So we put, we put the, uh, we really, I feel guilty now saying this, but we asked these people to come into a room with a video camera. And we asked them to sit down facing each other. And we gave each of them a piece of paper. Ready for this? OK, see if, I, if I'm clear enough to make it. And we asked each of them to say, OK, I want you to list three things in which you and your partner disagree about managing your diabetes. Just list them down. And they would do that. It's really easy. You take the two pieces of paper in the other room, and nine times out of 10, the first two are on both papers. I mean, they know what they disagree. We then walk back into the room and say to them, OK, the two of you have agreed that you disagree about X, OK, about your diabetes. For the next 10 minutes, I want you to talk about this and come to a resolution. And we walk out the room and turn on the video camera. What do you think happened? Arguing? OK. What else happened? They weren't able to reach a decision. Uh, how did that happen? Pressure. OK. I would be surprised if some of them didn't talk about it at all. 50% didn't talk about it. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> Good. This guy knows. Over 50% of the couples didn't talk for more than two minutes. They started to talk, if at all, and within two minutes the conversation stopped and they started looking at the room and pulling out their phones and doing it. There was, why? Well, because they had so much history with it that there was discouragement that they could come up with any resolution. Yeah, and there was no mechanism for a dialogue to resolve it the history, or the fact that they hadn't been able. It's hard. I, I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting that these were people who should have known better. I mean, that's, it's just incredibly hard to have a dialogue about such an emotionally powerful subject because it infects everything. He, she's worried that he's going to get sick later if he doesn't do better, whatever that means, right? And she doesn't want to see him you know, run into medical problems. And she also doesn't want to have to deal with, and I'm, I'm not saying you feel this way, but many partners will say, yeah, and if he gets sick, who do you think is going to have to be around to take care of him? So there's a burden aspect to it. I don't think they're being negative. It's a reality. And they don't want this to happen. But there's no mechanisms or few mechanisms within couples to help them find ways of talking through their diabetes. And, and resolving things about who's going to do what. For example, can, me, can I as a partner ask, well, uh, let's put it this way. Um, if, if my partner come, with diabetes comes back <clears throat> from work one day and they're kind of grumpy and what name, and I say, are you high? Are you high? Are you having a high? Why? Because people with high blood glucose often are irritable and grouchy, and, right? Are you having a high? If I'm the guy with diabetes, I'd be furious. I mean, what? I mean, why are you saying that? You know, I can be grumpy without it being high because it's now my fault because I didn't take enough insulin to get it down, right? You can see how all this plays out, okay? So the mechanisms for dealing with this have to do with 
how out of my concern can I communicate my concern in a loving way that allows us to kind of deal with the issues around a chronic disease that remain continuous. And what I'm suggesting is that's not built into the system. And people have to learn how to do that. Because if they don't do that, it, they become separate. And you, then they don't talk. And then they sit and stew. And then you see explosions from time to time as things go on. Oh, it's my disease. Just stay away from this. Don't touch it. I don't want you to talk about it. I'll take care of it myself. But there's other persons involved. But I can understand why. They don't want to feel as if someone's telling them what to do. So how do you resolve that kind of thing? That's part two of the emotional side of diabetes. Make sense? So we're talking about the, the effects of social context. We're talking about the, fact, the effects of relationship context. And we're talking about the burden of management all having effect on how one feels about their, their disease. And the more burdened they are, take a guess at what happens in terms of biologic markers. The higher the score on the burden scale, Cortisol goes up, and what's related? Inflammation goes up, all this other stuff. So what do you see? You see high blood glucose. You see higher A1C. You see less management. It's like, I give up. You know, it's like, you know, I'll do it, but I'm not going to really do it because it's just too much. So you see this thing beginning to escalate. And that's, that's a marker um, for negative outcomes which means the, the higher this thing goes, the less support they have, the greater the probability that complications will, will occur. The higher the number of complications and the higher the severity, the greater the emotional burden. The greater the emotional burden, the lower the medication adherence. What did you say? The greater the emotional burden, the lower the medication adherence. People are kind of like, you know, I'm giving up almost. Why? What's the use? I just can't keep this pace up. And when you were talking about fear of complications, which is a real big issue, it drives a lot of what we see, that fear is palpable. It is really palpable. People get scared. And they read all this stuff. So let me, let me, let me ask you a question, and it's a trick question in this regard. All right, true or false? Diabetes is the leading cause of kidney disease and blindness in the United States. Diabetes is the leading cause of kidney disease and blindness in the United States. True, true or false? True. 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 How many truths? How many false? Why do you say false? I'm sorry? Macular degeneration is the leading cause. It used to be diabetes, but now it's macular degeneration. And do you know why it used to be diabetes? That's the, it, the answer is false. Yeah. Diabetes is not the leading cause of either. Poorly controlled diabetes is the leading cause, <laughs> not diabetes. All right, I, it was a trick question. I, I, you know, it is a trick question. But what it emphasizes is the fear of complications and the progression of this disease over time and the effect that has on individuals. Whether it's a fear of a hypos, whether it's a fear of, of, on, of, of the emergence of a new complication or the exacerbation of an existing complication, these things really keep people up at night. And when working with people with diabetes around these issues, it's the goal is trying to keep these things in context, keeping perspective. Because without that, you know, you start really losing your perspective and you're, you, you just, the things spiral and you become miserable. Make sense? Yeah? Any questions on that? Because I covered an awful lot of stuff very quickly because the questions were kind of taking us that way, which is fine. Okay. So in the last little bit we have, let me talk about diabetes distress. Anybody hear that term before? Nobody heard, OK. Um, so this is an, an area that's emerged in the last 10 years. And um, 
Um, unfortunately, I've been in the center of it and making a mess of it, I'm afraid. But um, here's the kind of thing, the way it goes. The prevalence of depression among individuals with diabetes is, is, is thought to be high. By high, we're talking about anywhere from 10 to 15 percent. Okay? The, the prevalence of depression in a regular population, community population, is between 4 and 6 percent. So that's a doubling, and some people say a tripling. And so when you go to the doctor and they think you're depressed, off you go to get therapy or off you go to get medication, because those are the two primary treatments for depression. So when we were talking about splitting hairs, which is a really good point you raised, let me share with you why we moved from thinking about depression to thinking about distress. Because it's an important distinction. What is one of the symptoms of high blood glucose? What are some of the symptoms? People with high blood glucose? Crystal? Lethargy. Lethargy. Eating too much, eating too little. Maybe not sleeping very well. Those are three symptoms of depression. So is it depression or is it high blood sugar? Okay? There are three definitions of depression, and that's where we're really going to split hairs. One definition of depression is, I had $10 on the Warriors, they lost, and I'm really <laughs> bummed out and depressed. That's a descriptive, right? That's a descriptive use of the word depressed. Am I clinically depressed? Of course not. But I use the word depressed to describe my state, right? A second, way on the other extreme, is defined by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM. And it's a list of nine, that's a psychiatric, that's the handbook, and it tells you exactly what the definitions are and what you have to reach to be diagnosed with depression and other psychiatric <coughs> disorders. There are nine symptoms, and to be classified as clinically depressed, and the correct term is major depressive disorder, you have to have among other things, five of the nine symptoms for at least two weeks. Okay? Well, if three of them right off the bat are symptoms of, high, of hypoglycemia, or hyperglycemia, is that depression or hyperglycemia? Secondly, remember we talked about the burden of management? Is that depression? Or is that a realistic assessment that, yeah, anybody would be burdened with that having to do all that? Is that Psychopathology? Our argument is that it's not psychopathology, and we shouldn't treat it as psychopathology. We should be bringing the emotional part of diabetes into diabetes care. Because we should be shipping out to the mental health people, although there are some people with diabetes who are clinically depressed. I'm not talking about them. But the rates of high levels of diabetes distress are between 40 and, 36 and 42%. That's enormous. And the higher the distress, the poorer the management. Okay? That's drawing a line between the effects of the emotional side of diabetes, which has to do with distress of management, and we'll talk about some of the sources very quickly, and clinical depression. And that's where splitting the hairs is crucial, because it's easy to fall back into psychopatholo psychopathology to explain things, when it's much easier to think about the realities of what these people are living with in the real world. And, in that, and so I have been on a soapbox for 10 years screaming at people who want to medicalize the fact that people who are burdened with diabetes are people who are burdened with diabetes or any other chronic disease. But there's another group that says, oh, no, no, it's psychopathology. You've got to shift them over. You've got to treat it as this. And it's moving. The field is really moving. What are the sources of distress? For type 2, it's regimen distress, emotional burden, fears about health care, and fears, fears and, and difficulty around managing in the social context. Work, family, and friendships. For type 1, on basal bolus, the, sources, the primary sources of distress tend to be things like eating distress. And 70% of 500 that we, set, we assessed rated a feeling of powerlessness as the primary source of distress for them. 
And I can understand why. Those blasted blood glucose levels have a life of their own. So it's fear of hypos, eating, regimen, powerlessness, friends and family, social context. Who do I tell? Who don't I tell? What if, I, if I'm out with friends and, or other people and I need to take a shot or I need to adjust something or do a scan or whatever it is? Do I go to the ladies' room or the men's room? Do I do it out in public? Who should know? Who shouldn't? What effect that will have on how others see me? You know, all that kind of stuff are sources of distress. And that plays out and stays with people through, throughout their experience of this disease. And it ebbs and flows developmentally. We were talking about that briefly before. It changes. Uh, the higher levels of distress tend to occur for people in their 20s and 30s. Does that surprise anybody? Older people are much more, I wouldn't say used to it, but having a chronic disease when you're 60 is not the same as having a chronic disease when you're 20. It's, it's unexpected at 20. You should be healthy out there, you know, doing stuff, and all of a sudden you've got a cry. It doesn't fit. It's not the way we see each other. We see ourselves. So it's very different. So the age context is also, you can see how all these things play out. So for any of you that have a chronic disease, whether or not it's diabetes, these things play out as well. You still have worries. Cardiovascular disease, cancers, um, all kinds of stuff. The chronic disease, age, another chronic disease, as I mentioned, we all have these worries and concerns about our physical health, how we'll manage, how we'll deal with it with spouses and partners and offspring, adult offspring. Most of you are, are too young, um, but I have offspring that are 50. I have a 50-year-old and a 47-year-old. They're both parents, so I have grandkids. And it's very interesting, because I had some health problems. And how I talk to them about their reactions are totally un unexpected. They'll often say, well, you've got to do this, and you've got to do that, and you've got to do the other thing. It'll be fine. <laughs> well, I don't know. Okay? So the cross-generational issues in families. So there's also offspring, adult offspring, of people with diabetes. How are they going to see it? So that's, the, in, broad, in a broad brush, that's the emotional side of diabetes. I think we hit on every major area. And I think you can see the complexity of it and the humanness of it. And we can't forget the humanness. This is not pathology. This is people coping. Who said that originally? Did you say, somebody said coping. When I asked about what was struck you about, um, you said it. You said coping. Yes, you, I believe, yeah, that's, that, that's, it's how people and their partners and other people in their world cope, deal with, respond, and live with a chronic disease like diabetes that's demanding and progressive. And it's, an, it's something we need all, I think, both, uh, p both family members and healthcare providers, won't go there, need to be sensitive to. Thank you for dancing this dance. I appreciate your, your, your jumping in and, and um, providing the material that's necessary to have this discussion. Thank you.